is the um, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sasha Rabchevsky, or Alec is. Uh, uh, yeah, is that good? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I was practicing all this morning. I got up early. Um, he is currently an associate professor of physiology at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky, um, and is a, also a member of the Spinal Cord and Brain Injury Research Center there. Uh, he, uh, as you can see, was uh, paralyzed in a motorcycle accident. Be careful, Ravi, please. Okay, Ravi uh, rides a bike, as I did for 20 years as well. Um, and uh, this has uh, not slowed him down. Uh, he um, was uh, uh, graduated at Hampton Sydney College in Virginia uh, in 1987 and briefly worked as a technician at the NIH before he was accepted into the University of Florida Neuroscience Graduate Program where he graduated in 1990, 1995, excuse me. He then moved on to France and worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of uh, Paris, uh, uh, 12, I guess, 10 or 12, INSERM, UNITE, uh, whatever, 421, studying neuroimmunology, I, 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 practicing my French there, in the context of autoimmune diseases. And since 1997, he's been uh, at Lexington, where he's been investigating um, therapeutic approaches to treat ex uh, experimental spinal cord injury and has uh, become a, an expert in auto autonomic pathophysiology associated with spinal cord injury, particularly abnormal neural circuitry as it relates to uh, uh, hypertension and other uh, autonomic dysflexia. So without further ado, I'll allow you to take over. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay. Uh, it truly is an honor uh, to be here. I'm here for the Great White Mark. Uh, two and a half hour drive from the Detroit to Metro Lynn, and it was excellent. So we're very welcome here. And, uh, and I just want to start off by saying also with the to Dr. Lynn Weaver. As you'll see, a lot of this work is stemmed from her seminal work um, not a long time ago, <laughs> but it was seminal work nonetheless. Uh, is this okay? Am I okay? That's okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so I just want to give credit where credit due, as I will, as I will along this, and and also as, I, as you'll note toward the end, a lot of this work actually has been originated by Canadians, fellow Canadians. So I just want to take the time in advance to uh, acknowledge a lot of this work has been based upon work that was done here in Canada. So as you'll see, the com complicated title: modulation of intraspinal plasticity. We've talked about uh, plasticity uh, with Arthur's talk, and he mentioned the dark side of neuroplasticity, which Lynn had just recently read a, 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 written a paper in Experimental Neurology reviewing this. So that Arthur, you were on that as well. And uh, basically, that's what I'm going to be talking about, is that you know, for many years, I was paralyzed, as was mentioned, back in 1985. And you're always looking for the cure to walk again, to get that ultimate goal of restoring your life to normal function, as we well know it. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that 25 years after my accident, we can induce regeneration. We could promote regeneration. We can use genetic manipulation, which I'll be talking about. But the problem is, is that how do you get stuff to grow where it should be growing? And more importantly, when it does get to where it should not be going, what are the physiological consequences? And so sometimes this maladaptive plasticity is not necessarily a desirable thing on the part of the uh, patient, if you will, or clients. As many you can HMO and HMOs call them their clients, no longer patients. Um, oops, sorry. So this goes. No one? Okay. There we go. So I wanted to uh, begin this just by illustrating um, some common um, neuroanatomy that you should be familiar to for many of us, but for those not. This uh, is a human being, posterior view, okay? And this is a blow up of the somatomotor uh, spinal cord. So the somatic and motor components of that, i.e. the cervical enlargement, okay? Innervating the arms, upper extremities, lumbar enlargement, and the thoracic region. Now what this shows here is an X-ray of yours truly, back in 1985, where I had a complete T5, uh, uh, T5-6, fractured vertebrae, rendering me a, a complete Asia A T5 paraplegic uh, in 1985. And I draw a line here because, um, in effect, it's a very critical watershed area that I got injured at T6, 
which rendered me in a pre predisposed to a condition called, as you see in the title, called autonomic dysreflexia. In a moment, I'll describe precisely why T6 is important. However, it's important also to emphasize, as Arthur said, that this is a smart cable. This is still alive. There is still afferent input coming into here. There are still reflexes that occur, unless there's, of course, motor neuron damage, but in particular for upper motor neuron injuries. And so for my, in my instance, I actually have, and I don't have time to talk about this maybe afterwards, but I have functional electrical implants inside of me which allow my legs to contract, I can do exercises, and I can even stand up and walk with a walker. And that was my goal and my own kind of a mission kind of thing, and it has nothing to do with today's talk, but the point is, is that everyone, myself, Kim, we want to be able to get up and walk again, no doubt about it, we will take extreme measures. The question, though, happens, really, the real question is, if you're sitting around waiting for that cure, what are the things that occur to you on a daily basis that you would rather get rid of or uh, alleviate? that could possibly, I mean, obviously, improve the quality of your life, not necessarily make you walk. And so what I'll be discussing today is this condition called autonomic dysreflexia, which occurs in the majority of spinal cord injury patients. It's very under-recognized by the populace, but it is very well appreciated in clinic. The problem is, is though, the etiology is not entirely certain, and we'll be going over that, and also the way to remedy it or to alleviate it is also very uh, kind of murky. Oh, sorry. So I like this cartoon, and again, it's from the German uh, in the Canadian medicine, so I like that as well, keeping this all with the Canadian flavor, because this really does, it's a, one of the most ni nice illustrations to, to demonstrate to you what this reflex is, and how, why it's called autonomic dysreflexia. So you, when you have a full bladder, or in, in the case of our, my experimentations, or even Lynn's, you have a full impacted colon, okay, so constipation in the clinical sense, what happens is you have an afferent barrage that is not necessarily pleasurable. And we'll call it noxious because from the standpoint of the spinalization, the person, i.e. myself, does not feel it. So it's not pain per se, but it's a noxious stimulus. And somehow, as it comes into lumbosacral spinal cord, it is conveyed through the spinal cord rostrally, so up towards the brain, and it elicits a massive sympathetic response. So fight or flight, which means what? You're going to have a basic vasoconstriction, okay, which is going to lead to hypertension. And globally, above the level of the injury, all of your reflex circuits are still intact. When your blood pressure goes up, the compensation is for the heart rate to go down. Okay, so that's a normal response called the baroreflex. However, during that baroreflex-mediated bradycardia there no longer is the signal getting back down to the spinal cord to quench or quell the sympathetic hyperactivation. So what you have, therefore, is a sustained hypertension, but at the same time, you get diminished heart rate, i.e. bradycardia, which leads to, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, very uh, 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 kind of unpleasant, if you will, stimuli uh, and senses. So again, I don't want you to squint. I'm going to just describe this to you. What, what, what I want you to note here is where it says autonomic dysreflexia is a life-threatening emergency, I would like to emphasize that it's a potentially life-threatening emergency if you do not intervene and relieve the stimulus that's causing the hypertensive crisis, okay? Now, we've just heard from Arthur just a while ago, SOX 9, you can't even knock it out completely, and somehow there's a little residual. Well, as you'll, you'll be seeing here, we have ways of approach of diminishing this, but we can't completely knock it out because we don't understand entirely how it's me um, mediated, which I'll talk about toward the end. But what I want you to note here is that really the, the definitions that I keep saying is hypertension uh, and bradycardia at the same time. But what I also want you to focus on, although you've got to squint, <laughs> is that there's a lot of other symptoms. Seizures, chills, sweating, goosebumps, and, and here's what I would say, anxiety, apprehension. You know something is going wrong, which actually is a catch-22. I can't feel when I need to go to the bathroom, number one or number two. I can't feel if I'm sitting on a tap. But when I get an autonomic dysreflexic episode, something is telling me, back in the old school days, like uh, lost in space, Danger Will Robinson. <laughs> something is going wrong, okay? <laughs> Danger Will Robinson. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay? So it's almost like a premature warning system that has been unmasked. However, it's not pleasant. And the longer you have it, the worse it can be. And if autonomic dysreflex is unchecked, you can even have severe conditions, as like I said, seizures, or even in conditions uh, severe, you can blow an envelope. 
Okay? And actually, Andrei Krashikov, uh, who also is one of my mentors uh, over the years, has always, in his talks, talked about athletes that don't go up in wheelchairs, they pump up. And what I mean by pump up is they don't, they don't evacuate the bladders or they'll kink their catheters so that they increase their heart rate and uh, 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 basal metabolic rate and actually boost themselves. Okay? Uh, and that is not a wonderful thing, but it's kind of a natural phenomenon kicking onto something. But again, it goes to show you that people will use even dangerous things to push themselves to the limits. Now, what I also want to, I don't have time, but this demonstrates the examination tree. And this is what I'm talking about. So if I have something going wrong with myself, I don't know what exactly it is, I have to go there. I have to go to the bathroom. Number one or number two, am I sitting on a tap? My shoelace is too tight. Things of this nature. All of these things can, and then it goes down to gender. Okay, with gender, with women, and I don't know how many of you know this, but women, uh, quadriplegics, paraplegics, like with upper motor arm injuries, do experience uh, uh, autonomic dysreflexia, and in particular because they still go through menstruation. And you can imagine the pain that one receives when they can actually feel it. This kicks into an autonomic dysreflexic episode, which is an uncertain, but it certainly is a crisis. And like I said, the hypertension is the most important aspect of that. So, over the past decade, uh, what I've been doing is uh, uh, approaching the characterization, if you will, of how it is. Now, this is not just me. This is based on the work by Dr. Weaver and Dr. Larry Schramm and others, Dr. Brown, but kind of using those as templates for, to develop my own hypotheses and lines of research to looking at, in particular, when you look at a colon distension or cutaneous irritation or bladder distension, what are the pathways? What types of fiber types are, is it, are they conveying those messages into the spinal cord? And can you modulate them? Can you actually go in and genetically ma manipulate, like Arthur was saying, can you go in and change the genetic machinery to make sprouting more or worse? And then correlate that with the amount of dysreflexia. Secondly, a lot of uh, electrophysiological studies done by Larry Schramm and Andrei Krashkov, some of them seminal back in 2002. They had one of the uh, uh, one of the spinal cord paper research uh, papers of the uh, year of the award. And what they had shown was that there are, in fact, sympathetically correlated interneurons that are relating col colorectal distension up to sympathetically related kidney, uh, sympathetically related uh, IML neurons or sympathetically preganglionic neurons that are causing this. And so there is some kind of information that is being relayed, indicated here by this, this green relay proprioceptive neuron. But again, when I started these studies, it was just, it, it was shown physiologically, but it hadn't shown, been shown anatomically or otherwise. And secondly, the things that I've been looking at, and I'll end this talk with today, is how do you modulate the output? If you have this sympathetic response, and it's causing massive vasoconstriction, there are medications that will be hypertensive drug, uh, drug. it will decrease your blood pressure. But the problem with all of that is that it, it alleviates the symptom, but it doesn't get rid of the problem. And that's what I'm getting back to uh, again, is that you can take medicines, you can even take pain medicines, you will reduce it, but you haven't gotten rid of the stimulus. And many uh, people know about Christopher Reeve and all of the things that he went through and what a, what a champion he was for the cause, but I don't know how many people here know how he died. And it was due to secondary complications of his spinal cord injury. In particular, one, the cubitus, okay, which is skinny breakdown. Now, this is Superman. Right? You think, well, Superman, breakdown, he had 24-hour care, but it was nonetheless precipitated. Now, I don't have any evidence to suggest it, although I've heard anecdotal stories, that if you have a decubitus and you have an ulcer, what is that going to produce? It's going to produce lots of pain. And it would also increase his incidence of autonomic dysreflexia. So I don't think everybody ever asked him, and I don't think any clinician would ever admit it, but I would venture to say that there were a lot of complications secondary to his injury manifested in autonomic dysreflexia that diminished the quality of his life. So I'm going to just briefly, and I promise you, go down just a couple experiments I've done over the past several years of how we've looked at this circuitry and how it works, or how it's connected, so to speak, neural substrates, if you will, as, as I said, putative neural substrates involved in this. And then I'm going to talk about um, some of the procedures that we, want, that we go through. And we actually first tried to genetically manipulate the sprouting to see if we could change dysreflexic uh, severity, autonomic dysreflexic severity. But then 
more recently, we've been looking at pharmacological approaches in a clinical setting, or preclinical setting, I should say, to see if we can alleviate deaths to drug uh, manipulations. So <clears throat> Arthur and Lynn and many others have already documented quite a while back, not that long, quite a while back from my standpoint, from my timeline, that following spinal cord injury, and here are your dorsal root uh, ganglion with your afferent neurons, would you say the green or the red or the pain and the, uh, the red or the, or, or the proprioceptive, it doesn't matter, just there's a collection of neurons that are coming in. And normally they terminate you know, in the dorsal lamina, but after spinal cord injury, and in particular due to the well-documented uh, studies uh, of, of the upregulation of neural growth factor in the spinal cord, is that you get the sprouting of afferent fiber types. So it's interesting, you get a spinal cord injury, and growth factors actually upregulate, and you get sprouting. And you get sprouting of sensory fibers in particular, but that's a good thing, right? Because you want regeneration. The problem is, is that what happens is, is that in many cases, there are, as I said, maladaptive plasticity, and you get overgrowth, and you get too much sprouting. And so Lynn's work, the seminal work with Natalie Krentz, and even Andre's work, and, and Art as well, has shown that if you block nerve growth factor with antibodies into thecal, into these animals, and you give them colorectal distension experimentally, it knocks out, it abates the hypertensive dysreflexive response, and they correlated it back to looking at C-fiber sprouting, and it was abolished or abrogated. Again, it's pointing to the first mechanism, which I started to become interested in, is how is the after input, which is most important to coming in? So what we chose to do is use adenovirus, again, genetic manipulation of the environment, to see if we overexpress either nerve growth factor, <coughs> with the anticipation if we overexpress the nerve growth factor, we would get more sprouting of nociceptive C fibers, and therefore corresponding get worse autonomic dysreflexia uh, induced by colorectal extension. Or conversely, we overexpress semaphorin 3A, which is a uh, chemorepulsive agent for both, interestingly enough, C fibers as well as sympathetic uh, fibers as well. And we targeted the IML originally, but then we found out the trials and tribulations, actually, we had to actually target the regions of innervation where uh, colonic affluence were coming in, so L6, S1. And so when we did that, what we found here, here is our injection sites, I believe I have a, so here's where our injection sites were, either the L6, S1 or T13, L1. This sort of shows uh, just a representative section of a bilateral injection into the dorsal horn of a green fluorescent protein, showing that we can efficiently transduce endogenous cells to express our gene of interest. And then here are these Mickey Mouse ears sort of outlining the area, so to speak, of the densitometry. And I think you can well appreciate that when we gave NGF, the nerve growth factor, there was massive sprouting of nociceptive fibers into the, throughout the spinal cord. Conversely, when we gave semaphore and 3A, we found a, a significant reduction in the sprouting of nociceptive C fibers. And in fact, there was a significant correlation when we, when we unblinded and, we, and correlated, those animals that got the semaphore and 3A had the least severity and the least sprouting, and it was highly correlated. Conversely, the animals that got the NGF had more sprouting and more severe. Well, this actually was very eloquent, eloquent, I'd like to say, but it was not too much more of a further extension that had already been demonstrated by Lynn and Arthur back then, and, and, and Natalie and, and Andre. So the question still arises, we didn't quite get rid of it. And this is the other thing that I want to make sure it's important. Is that one thing we put to what I've been pitching to the to the grants people that always ask, well, you're not wiping out autonomic dysreflexia, is that I don't think I want to. And again, I told you all before, it's an early auto, it's a, it's a system that kind of lets you know that something is wrong. So if you can abate it and make it lessen, great. But I don't think you want to completely eliminate it because then you're not, then you again, you're not getting rid of the stimulus that is actually causing the insipidus response. So uh, what I'm going to do now is just quickly, I'll just, so, so the first thing we did was we injected uh, collar toxin beta into the colon. <coughs> to demonstrate what kind of fiber types are actually sprouting into the spinal cord from the colon, uh, the afferent types after uh, spinal cord injury. Oops, sorry about that. Secondly, uh, in another study, we injected fluorogol intraperitoneally, very expensive kind of study, but what it does, it's, it, it, it's very nice. The blood vessels pick it up, and since every, all the blood vessels are innervated by sympathetic neurons, you can light up the entire intermedial lateral cell column or all sympathetic preganglionic neurons in the spinal cord. And why we did that is because we then injected anti-grade tracers into these putative projection pathways. 
And when we did that, what the hope was, was that we would find juxtapositioned labeling these sprouting aphra. Now, we're not talking descent. This is another thing that's important to understand. And I will talk briefly in a moment. Descending pathways are very important, we know that. But I'm talking about what's happening within the spinal cord below. And what I'm gonna show you is that a lot of stuff is happening in an ascending manner, okay? And so thirdly, what we then did was once we've established, and I'll show you in a moment, once we got these projections and, and characterized them, we then wanted to make sure when we back label, so can we inject here after all this spouting, we should get more retrograde labeling of these proprio-spinal projection neurons. And in fact, that's what we did find. So this is the first demonstration. Uh, I don't, I have, it's all published results, they're quantified. I just have the pretty pictures to show you. And we injected cholerotoxin beta. This is an animal that had been transected two weeks prior to the cholerotoxin beta versus the naive animal. And you can see well that there is an increased sprouting in the dorsal laminate as well as these, uh, 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 some of the autonomic nuclei. And more interestingly for us was this central area called the dorsal great commissure, which is very important in visceral pain uh, 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 propagation in a rostral caudal axis. So this was the first evidence, and then also we wanted to find out, well, what kind of subtypes are there. Now, now Lynn had done some work in the past uh, looking at some myelinated five phenotypes, and unmyelinated phenotypes. We wanted to make sure from the colon, what is showing up? Are they myelinated or are they unmyelinated? So what we found was when we did CGRP, which is a peptide for, for peptidergic uh, nociceptive neurons, we did find co-localization, I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. However, when we looked at myelinated fiber types, we saw no, none whatsoever, which wasn't terribly surprising to us, except that people had always demonstrated that CTB was a labeler for uh, myelinated uh, axons. But then going through the literature, it depends on which paper you read. So what we then did was, uh, as I showed in this picture, when you highlight this area here, there was virtually complete overlap of the CGRP and the CTB, indicating that the majority, if not all of the uh, fibers that were coming from the colon into the spinal cord were unmyelinated phenotype. So then the next step was in this, in this schematic was that, okay, we know that we've got afferent sprouting into this region here. Does the afferent sprouting into this region at all activate or somehow increase the sprouting of, the, of, the, of these proprio spinal neurons? And the quick answer is yes. We did it in various fashions. You can see here, we did it in, uh, uh, either a unilateral injection or bilateral injections. And what you can see here is in a transected animal here on the right side of the panels, both the thoracic, so this is high up or near the injury site, I mean the injection site, the lumbosacral. By the way, these animals are transected T4, so way high up two weeks before that. So a lot of reorganization has occurred. And what you find is that in these animals that were transected, there's massive sprouting of these ascending fibers. Uh, it was very unequivocal. We demonstrated this at the quantitative level. And moreover, what was most important to us is we wanted to say, OK, if we are injecting into here, do we find juxtaposed labeling of these with the sympathetic neurons? And in fact, we do. Now, this is now Ida Llewellyn Smith, for instance, would argue, well, you need to do EM because you haven't shown that they're just, you know, they're not synapse formation. And we're not suggesting that there are. I'll just talk to you about it in a moment because we don't necessarily think that they're directly acting on the sympathetic neurons, but maybe even via interneurons. But, but the point is, is that there are sprouting fibers that are going up that are temporally uh, and spatially uh, uh, found during the time in which autonomic dysreflex is manifested. So then we wanted to see if, in fact, there's more sprouting. And if you believe that there, so if you take your hand and you got two or three fingers, okay, and those are the sprouts that you normally have, and all of a sudden now you put up both hands and you got a bunch of fingers up there, it's just the propensity for picking up any label, retrograde label, is going to increase. It doesn't mean, and this is where I had an issue with the reviewers, it doesn't mean there's more neurons regenerating. It's more neurons that are sprouting and picking up the fiber, uh, the, the, the uh, label. And so here we did it with either CTB in around T9, we injected bilaterally, or with fast blue. And what we found was when we looked down uh, one week after transport, we, when we looked in the dorsal gray commissure in the region of the uh, L6S1 innervation, we found a lot more retrograde labeled neurons. And again, corroborating the evidence that, or, or should say correlating, I should say, the evidence that when you have sprouting, uh, above with the BDA labeling, it is reflected in more retrograde labeling of uh, these proprio spinal projection neurons. Something that had not been demonstrated before this, but it still begs the question, what are they? Whoops, I'm sorry, what are they? So we started to look at the phenotype of these types of projection neurons. 
And lo and behold, <laughs> you pick your one, there was one that was co-localized. So we found inhibitory, so the CTV, these are the uh, retrogradely labeled neurons, double labeled with GABA, GLUT, or CHAT, and so they were excitatory, inhibitory, as well as cholinergic, which leaves one in a quagmire figuring out, well, where are we, and where do we go with this? So the working hypothesis at the time when, when these studies uh, finished up was that if you just pay attention to this box here, that these projection neurons can have one of two possible pathways. They can either have a direct excitatory input onto these IML neurons, okay? Or more likely, we believe, and we uh, don't have direct evidence, but we're working on that now, is that we, may, we believe that maybe they are working on inhibitory interneurons. And by inhibiting an inhibitor or unmasking an inhibitor, you will actually create excitation. And this is interesting because when you look, and so the first uh, one of three Canadian studies I'm gonna be uh, describing briefly, uh, one of Dr. Uh, Lynn Weaver's uh, former protégés, Dan Marsh, uh, had, had noticed that, again, the, after spinal cord injury, the particular model that we're using, there was a, uh, a loss of these, well, I should say, a loss of the inhibitory uh, neurons following spinal cord injury, and there he was indicating that this may create a permissive circuit for nociceptive thresholds. Okay, so again, tying in with what I was talking about. And actually, other people now, Clifford Wolf was on this vein, a lot of people were beginning to think that there is a switch, and there's a lot of GABAergic uh, overdrive that happens in pain models. Secondly, okay, when we were talking about this today, was the Lynn's work with the alpha, uh, uh, anti, excuse me, alpha-4 beta integrin uh, uh, treatment. And what it does with this treatment in the spinal cord injury model, it significantly decreases blood pressure responses in, uh, with respect to autonomic dysreflexia. So it's a different process with this because now they've used the neuroprotective agent to ameliorate or, or lessen the amount of dysreflexia. And the theory behind this is it's because there's a lot more sparing of white matter, and in particular, white matter, descending white matter, okay, that increase or maintain vasomotor tone. Okay, so they, they uh, make bulbospinal and in particular serotonergic, okay, 5-HT, right? Now, 5-HT is also implicated in spasticity and other uh, kinds of models uh, for, of locomotion, but there are also uh, rep many different repertoires of 5-HT subtypes. So the other paper I thought that I should put up there, another Canadian work, but also one, one more of Dan Marsh's work, which I actually reviewed, very important is that what, what he demonstrated very, very exquisitely was that loss of serotonergic inputs to the spinal cord IML or to the pre sympathetic preganglion nerves was proportional to the pathogenesis of autonomic dysreflexia. So the more serotonin, so now we're not talking about an auto, a, a somatomotor component for movement, we're talking about serotonergic fiber density below the injury level, and in particular the IML, was correlated with the amount of autonomic pathophysiology or autonomic dysreflexia. So now we have several processes going on. We have afferent sprouting below the injury. We have maybe GABAergic neurons overdriving, but we also have, and very importantly, descending serotonergic systems that if they're left intact or pharmacologically manipulated also seem to modulate uh, the, 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 the pathogenesis or the, the, the uh, pathophysiology. So to, to wind up with one more Canadian, okay, Andrei Kostikov. It, it, very interesting is that when he wrote this article back in 2006, and this was one that Lynn, Lynn had uh, uh, edited, this particular one, and I was one of the contributing authors, but really the question became, with all the animal models that we do, which pathways must be spared in the injured human spinal cord to retain cardiovascular control? And when you look at the difference between the human and the mouse and the rat, it's very different. So the question starts becoming, okay, you can do all these characterizations, but really, what is being done in the clinic? for people with spinal cord injury. So I recently wrote, oops, sorry, oops. Uh, I recently wrote a review paper with a colleague, Dr. Patrick Kitzman, who's a uh, physio, uh, PT, physical therapist, who actually specializes in muscle spasticity, and he's, and he's done a lot of work in, in the tail spasticity model in a rat. And we got together years back and, and asking ourselves some central questions about, well, what drug are you using to reduce spasticity? 
And he, lo and behold, he started talking about a drug called, well, before I get into that, let me say it. So when you look at uh, latest approaches, this really is modern, uh, up to date, of uh, both spasticity and autonomic dysreflexia. Really, when it comes to spasticity, there's a lot of things like um, uh, baclofen, um, uh, 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 diazepam, things that are going to slow down reflexes, which are naturally, uh, they're actually quite, uh, sorry, there we go. But what is used for spinal cord injury in the context of autonomic dysreflexia is that when you see it happen in the clinic or at home, you take either nitrates or nifedipine, calcium channel blocker, okay? Again, this is to reduce systemic blood pressure or peripherally to work on blood vessels so you can use alpha adrenergic blockers. However, none of these conditions ever abate you completely. And when you use nitrates, which sometimes can be very, very hypotensive, you can actually put the patient into a crisis. And typically when you use nitrates it's in a clinical setting, you're not going to do it at home, except for, interesting enough, nitro-based. So one of the most effective measures uh, to reduce autonomic dysreflexia is to put about two inches of nitro-based glycerin right onto your chest. Okay, and when the symptoms abate and your blood pressure rose, you can actually wipe it off. And really, what I'm going to get to with the next talk is that we're trying this pharmacologically. That is right now some of the one of the best approaches to be able to abate it, but it still doesn't get to the question of getting rid of the stimulus. So we started looking at a compound called gabapentin. Now, many of you here have probably heard of Lyrica, okay? Uh, Lyrica for fibromyalgia, okay, for, for, for uh, neuropathic pain. Um, gabapentin was its precursor, developed by Pfizer also. It is no longer on patent. Uh, it is off-label use, and actually it was never indicated for neuropathic pain. It was developed because of its name, thought to be a GABA, GABA inhibitor or GABA agonist, uh, and it was developed as such for epilepsy. However, throughout the years, it was starting to be used in the clinic, spinal cord injury clinic, on a regular basis for neuropathic pain. Uh, through anecdotal studies, because there were no quantitative e evidence to suggest that it worked. So again, for neuropathic pain, it was being used. Well, Patrick published a paper back in 2007 where he used gabapentin to show that if you transected the, a rat spinal cord in the lower uh, sacral region, to basically spare the animal, it's humane, the animal gets to walk around, but his tail is paralyzed. And he showed with this method that if you give a gabapentin, you can completely abolish the uh, abnormal somatic reflexes, clonus, uh, or anything with gabapentin treatment. And so I asked him the question, well, what if you were to take an animal, and instead of transecting it at the S1, what if you transected it all the way up into the thoracic region, in the T4? Would you still be able to get this effect with the sp spasms in the tail? And he looked at me and went, I don't know, I think so, probably. And I said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we try to go for a two for one punch? Let's see if we can knock out the, the tail spasms, which you've already demonstrated. But at the same time, does it affect autonomic dysreflexia? Because both are autonomic, one, output, motor output, two, somatomotor output. Their common mechanism of how they get triggered, which is a noxious stimulus that comes in through the afferent, which leads to a somatic or autonomic output. So what we in effect, try, uh, in, in effect tried to do was we, we took this drug, gabapentin, it's called Neurontin, okay, it used to be called Neurontin, like it's now it's Lyrica, like I said, it's being upgraded, also produced by Pfizer. And we, what we did was, for those of you who haven't seen the trace, uh, trace it before, this demonstrates uh, the pulsatile arterial pressure of an animal during resting state, and then the CRD is colorectal distension. As you can see, there is a significant increase in blood pressure, during which there's concomitant bradycardia, which defines the condition. Notice, though, in the animals that got gabapentin, not only was the pulsatile pure uh, systolic, diastolic very, very narrowed down, the animals actually just were very quiescent. Okay? And true, also, uh, the, the bradycardia was significantly decreased, and that's shown here. There's a threefold reduction in the severity. It's not wiped out completely, it's important to understand, but it's, it, it is abated. And the variability precluded a significant difference, but the bradycardia was also decreased significantly. So the question that we started asking ourselves is, well, what's going on here? So we went and filed with FDA for an investigation, new drug, one drug, they can get three different symptoms, three different neuropathic pain, all right, we got hammered. And why? Because Pfizer was sued for $2.3 billion for off-label use of gabapentin for neuropathic pain. 
even though it's still being used to this day, the United States, I don't know about Canada, but it's still being used. The first thing you get when you get, even if you don't have neuropathic pain, they give you gabapentin. And it's a kind of a controversial thing as to why that's happening, but the bottom line is that because it's off patent, because Pfizer, Pfizer won't play with us, they didn't give us the toxin studies, so we could not go and file for any more indications. We had some NIH funding for preliminary data, we had to halt, we had to halt it. So what we then did was we said, oh, I'm sorry, I also want to point out, in these same animals, I apologize, in these same animals, once we did the colorectal distension paradigm, we moved it to another table and we did the tail pinch spasticity measurement, and lo and behold, it knocked out the spasms as well. So again, this was, I should have shown you that before the, the two-prong or three-prong approach. I apologize. But again, with one drug, we abated three different types of symptoms. Okay, and this is something that when I saw this evidence and I made my postdocs repeat it three or four times, I was like, I have never seen anything work like this in all the years I've been doing research. And yet, it just wasn't, I don't know if it's sexy enough, if it's not powerful enough, my message wasn't enough, but basically they didn't want to play with this quote unquote dirty drug anymore. So now what we've been doing is using instead now gabapentin as a tool, excuse me, of investigation. Because now we know, and here's the beauty of it, you can use telemetry systems, I know that we, you have it in place here. We actually learned it from Andrei Krasnikov and, and, and use, it in my, use it in my laboratory now. Incredible amount of data that you can generate 24-7 with these animals. Over weeks and weeks of data, right? Gigabytes, terabytes of data. I know that you will, many of you would deal with that. It's, it's kind of daunting. But what we started to ask ourselves, if we're going to ever go to clinic with anything, you can't induce autonomic dysreflexia in a person. You're just not going to get IRB approval. Okay, well, you could, but it'd be in a really radical way of doing it, okay? So the question came upon us is how can you monitor spontaneous autonomic dysreflexia using just blood pressure data. So again, this is very complicated here, but what we did was we said, well, we're going to use uh, an algorithm. So we developed an algorithm with uh, the help of some biostatisticians and some electrical engineers. And basically what we defined, and this is the other th nice thing about this algorithm, we defined it as classically defined as when the blood pressure is increased above baseline, and the concomitant bradycardia occurs during that same period of time, we call that an autonomic dysreflexic event. And I'll show you some data that comes, but before I get to that data, I want to say that was our operational definition. In the clinic, and this is what Andrei Krasnikov and many others would argue, is that you don't necessarily have to have bradycardia to consider it an autonomic dysreflexic event. In other words, you can have tachycardia and have a massive uh, a hypertensive crisis, and that is still considered autonomic dysreflexia. So, we were rather conservative with, with, with our measures, but still what it allowed us to do is that, whether we look, just regard this for a second, when we looked at over 24 hours after injecting the animal, so this is pre-injury data, and these are after, and this demonstrates that with the saline treated animals in a lighter color, there were more dysreflexic events over a 24 hour period than were the animals like a gabapentin. But more importantly, gabapentin's half-life is four hours. So what, when we looked at just the first, for over the four hours, interestingly, autonomic dysreflexia does not permanently develop until about 14 days or two weeks after spinal cord injury. This is when we started to see the differences in the effects in the first four hours, okay? And what, we were very encouraged by this because this was the first evidence to suggest that you don't necessarily need to induce. And here's another thing that we've done after we published this paper. We went back and we changed our parameters. We said, let's forget about bradycardia, and let's just look and see if we get 30 millimeters of mercury or more. And when we did that, we found extremely significant results. So again, it's, and the powerful thing about developing an algorithm that is very useful to other people is that they can use it. So for instance, Phil Popovich at Ohio State University is collaborating with us. He's doing this very same paradigm, but in mice, which is a much different model because mice have many more spontaneous episodes of autonomic dysreflexia because of the fact that they do not spontaneously void after a while their pee. So they're constantly having full bladders, and if you don't express them, they get hypertensive crisis. So it's a very different, and they're tweaking, and they're getting ready to publish their algorithm to see how it works in, 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 in relation to ours. But the bottom line is I think this is very important for us because what this does is it sets the stage. Because it's a preclinical data, it's compelling. I've never seen a drug that works this. I've done it myself. I've even taken it myself. It works. I try to pinch myself. I don't get a reflex. That's not the thing you want to put through an IRB, but it does work. Also, I go to hospitals. I talk with patients. I ask them anecdotally, and they tell me yes. 
The bottom line is, is to go back, though, and try to now redo all these studies with Lyrica or pregabalin is going to be a mountain for us to do. So what we are using, we're actually using gabapentin as a tool, and I'm doing this in collaboration with folks in the University of Melbourne, John Furness uh, as an example, uh, James Brock uh, in Melbourne, and we're actually trying to figure out, can we use gabapentin to tease out the mechanisms by which these things are working? Because gabapentin is thought to be working by, by blocking presynaptic calcium channels. So blocking the release of, in particular, glutamates. But, but remember I told you, we never abate it. We never completely get rid of it. So something else is going on. So we really like to, and right now I'm not going to have time, but we're looking at both central targets, but we're also looking at peripheral targets. So we're, set, we're focusing now on how is gabapentin affecting the sensitization of primary afferent neurons in the L6S1, as well as, and here's where it gets really tricky, the activity of close ganglionic sympathetic neurons which is a real bear. Uh, I've been working, uh, actually discussing with Elspeth McLaughlin and Vaughn uh, Maysfield, uh, in, also in Australia, and trying to come up with some paradigms that how do we look at those measures of outcome to see if our drug is having a central versus peripheral effect. Because you can imagine, if it's peripheral, you're going to have a much easier target than having to get into the central nervous system. So anyway, I'm going to leave that uh, and with, with the acknowledgments of all the people that have helped me and opened up the floor for questions. Uh, in particular, the first people I want to thank that are not listed at all are all the past technicians that work diligently to do this. I mean, I, they never get enough credit, but that's why they get first billing. Secondly, these are my former postdocs that have all uh, gone on, and actually Xiao Ping is now himself uh, at Drexel now working on autonomic dysreflexes, so I feel like this is my first fledgling is carrying on the torch, so to speak. Uh, all my UK collaborators that have helped me out over the years uh, in the Department of Physiology, as well as other departments uh, in the rehab science, as I mentioned, Patrick Kitzman and Kevin Donahue in the electrical engineering. And then lastly, outside collaborators, Larry Schramm at Hopkins, Lynn Weaver, I think you all know her, uh, Dr. Andrei Krashikov at uh, British Columbia, I or Toronto, wherever he is, he seems like he's everywhere, uh, Phil Popovich and Jeff Petruska, uh, some fellow Americans that have helped me out, and then finally John Furness. And lastly, uh, this never would have gotten done. In particular, my first grant was from the International Spinal Research Trust on this fledgling condition that Lynn introduced me to, to me you know, over a decade ago, and now it's come full circle, and now we're actually looking at mechanisms trying to evade it. So thank you very much, and I open up the floor for questions. The gabapentin story, um, where are you going to, you can use it uh, to try to work off mechanisms for mm -hmm. but is there nowhere to go with um, some other gabapentin-like drug so that something could be developed for pharmacological treatment? Right. So, yes, in, a, they, in, this, in Australia they call them gabapentinoids. <laughs> So they, develop, they actually have developed many drugs that are gabapentin-like. And yes, I think we can. The problem is going to be going through the FDA and getting approval for all these things. And so for me to go to Lyrica, for instance, I would have to completely redo all my preliminary studies because the action and half-life is completely um, changed. Uh, the mechanism of action, however, <laughs> between gabapentin and pregabalin is not known. They don't know why they were, why they say that pregabalin is more effective and longer lasting. It's never been, far, I mean, when I was told that to the Australians, they laughed. They said, this never been shown, you know? And yet, they're marketing it. And by the way, pregabalin, if you, it's expensive. It's, if I could get a pen for, for the doctors, it's eight bucks for a hundred, you know, because of insurance. If I buy gabapentin for my rat studies, it's $4,000 for five grams for the USP GMP grade. So they, they really got you. And then, OK, so let's do Lyrica. Huh. Bump that price up even higher. Okay. So it is kind of strange. And I wonder if I, I was telling Kim, I just go home and I take my little pet and pills and screw, <laughs> pull out the thing, take it home. Yeah, yeah, I got it from the GMP grade. <laughs> you know. But that therein lies the thing. So it's, the question is that right now, what, what I'm faced with is where do I go with this tool? Get a pen. Do we go with it clinically? It's already being used in a clinic. It's going to be very difficult to do retrospective 
in a particular subject of studies to ask people, do you get autonomic dysreflexia? Which is why, again, I think the, the, the algorithm in measuring spontaneous autonomic events are going to be much more important with any kind of drug that you give if you want to see if it has cardiovascular consequences. Um, but to get back to the central question, so we, just real quick, we just completed a study with gabapentin, and we wanted to look at, if you get prolonged, repeated uh, colorectal distension, you know, well, we've already shown that when you do that, when I say prolonged, 90 minutes, 30 minutes off, 60 seconds off, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, uh, 60 seconds off, and these animals are not happy. <laughs> Uh, that will induce massive CFOS expression inside the spinal cord. Not of animals that are awake and conscious and uninjured. They're just jumping around and they're mad, but they don't have CFOS expression. The animals that are, that are spinalized, they do have a credible CFOS expression. And so the, 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 the question then becomes, is gabapentin, and we're looking at this now, is gabapentin modulating CFOS expression at all? The problem is, is that we never have taken animals that when we this is a poor design on our part. We do repeated 90 minutes of colorectal distension. The gabapentin has its effects when we use telemetry for almost 30 minutes. But for that last 60 minutes, it wears off. I think it becomes habituated. And therefore, we find no differences in any of the markers that we've been looking at, whether it's PR, P38, things of this. So we think that what we're having is the ill-conceived design that we need to be looking much more acutely at the effects of gabapentin. Michael, you had a question. Really, uh, it's really, I think, a comment on the challenges of moving forward um, approved drugs for off-label uses, and um, there are ways to do it, but it's you know, it basically, for what you just saw, like, you know, with the company, the company basically can't support it. The mechanism right now is that they want to get an on-label indication at the file 9 as you know. They promote the off-label use, it's illegal We face a similar challenge with moving forward, really is all so you tell a lot of you know, trials. But I guess the, the, the way to move that forward is either through foundational support or through peer review uh, support. There are many advantages to moving forward with improved drugs, well, safety data, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think we need to have multiple tracks to do it, but the drug company won't be interested. No. The well, they, I think their biggest fear is that we'll come up with another indication that is bad for their... For their There's not a financial, but you see there's incentive. not a financial incentive for the people. Right. physicians are already using the drug very widely for your account so they're not going to gain additional market. But the gain is really the public interest, and I think this is one of the things that I've been trying to persuade uh, you know, governments terms of doing this, healthcare expenditures are so expensive that this will be cost effective mm -hmm. to show effective means of doing that. And I actually think that that's where the deep pockets are. And respectfully, I think that governments are spending too much money on chasing treatments that don't work very well. They need to spend a bit more money on R&D and then reinvest it. And that's, a, that's an interesting discussion. And we cannot only rely on the industry to bear the Issue here. And we just saw a huge lawsuit that got filed against them. Yeah. And that's, that's daunting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think we'll continue in the time to keep on time. We'll finish it there. Yes. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much.